Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Still Growing in Grace on this wonderful Wednesday morning, 8 a.m.-ish. Uh, thank you for tuning in. If you're watching, say hello online and tell us where you're watching from. It's always really cool to see the places folks are chiming in from. Um, this morning's topic is, uh, I didn't think we'd do part two, but last week we did a part one on anger. Is it controlling you? Now, this topic of anger has many tentacles that we could uh, explore and uh, many facets we could go down and kind of see, hey, how does this topic of anger apply to our lives? Is it righteous anger? Is it, uh, am I allowed to get angry? Well, uh, go back and watch last week's for sure. It was really good. And I think today's will be really helpful too. Um, Richard and I are having a really important conversation on this. Um, and again, part of part of my motivation to deal with this topic, um, just so you know which tentacle I'm kind of exploring, um, I think there are some folks who are um, using anger as in, uh, I'm, I'm allowed to get angry, it's not a sin, therefore I'm going to maximize my freedom to be angry uh, in this journey of deconstruction, unlearning, and so on. When really, um, I think they're misunderstanding this, this subtle freedom, and they may not even think they're doing it, but the fruit of it is showing. A person will live their lives and to find out what's living on, going on in their heads, the, the fruit of how they behave, how they... Um, the energies that come from them will reveal what they're thinking about and how they're processing all this. And I think Richard says something really profound in this one today that I think you, you got to hear. So let's chime in. And uh, if you're struggling with uh, anger and how to understand it and process it, I think this will be a, another part two healthy conversation. So let's dive right in because this is a good one. Here we go. All right. Hello, uh, Richard and Bill. I'm so glad you took time to join me today on Still Growing in Grace. And uh, this topic is, I think it's the very first time. Me today on Still Growing in Grace. And topic is, I think it's the very All right. first time. I had one boo-boo. Give me a moment here to fix this little error. Uh, that's the wrong video. My right. bad. Let me just go and correct that right now. I thought I had done that and I obviously didn't. So let me just get our video running that was last week's because i thought hey wait a minute bill wasn't part of that <laughs> just very funny all right here we go okay let me get this one going let's hope the uh um let's hope it goes here we go uh, it may i may have to do one more adjustment but i can do that while it's running live here we go oh Okay, today's a special edition, mind you, every edition is special, because um, we got Richard here with us, and uh, uh, Bill couldn't make it this time, uh, which is fine, he's got lots going on, I think he's got a huge honeydew list that, is, that he's going through, I have one too, I'm just trying to avoid my wife, <laughs> I'm just kidding, <laughs> <laughs> it's a big list, I, I, said, uh, I said to her, once the weather turns nice, my attitude will change, I'm sorry, so. <laughs> is it nice up there now? No. No, okay. we had a uh, freezing rain this morning. We have a really like 80 kilometer an hour, whatever that is in miles winds, which is pretty heavy wind, mist rain coming hard. It's just a yuck, gross gray day. <laughs> oh, it so, is so here. You would not believe it. I mean, I, I've been by the pool at the gym for a couple of hours. <laughs> it's so not fair. <laughs> I love it. My wife was at a garage sale this morning and uh, first one of the year. And the people were selling said, we're moving to Florida and we're not taking anything but our dog with us. We're getting rid of everything. We should, we don't want to live here anymore. We want to move to Florida. <laughs> so, so, I love okay. it. Love it. Travel wide. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Well, let's get into a uh, Last time we chatted, we, we were kind of talking about anger and processing it. And there was a lot of positive feedback uh, last time from folks private messaging me or just tell me in person, um, which is interesting because, it must touch a nerve 
uh, of a something we just don't talk about enough. And likely everyone deals with it at a different level. So I thought maybe, maybe we continue on it, see where it's going. I got another loaded question if we get to it. If we don't, that's for another conversation. But um, you had some pondering because I saw you posted some stuff this week on the topic of anger as if you're still talking and thinking it through too. So what what's going on, man? Well, it's it did strike a few nerves, and there were a lot of posts I, I noticed this week, and I fully accept the idea that when we're all Facebook friends together, somebody can post something and not, a, you know, not come and try to get on your page and divert it, but then try to post something on their page, which is perfectly, that's, I actually like that. And, and then somewhere, you know, if we have common and joint friends, somewhere between the middle, you know, we can maybe reach a consensus or at least a, a respectful, you know, a respectful consensus. Uh, so um, I, uh, I'm i always, you know, I got I got <laughs> Mike, just let me know I'm looking at the wrong side of the screen. That is my <laughs> life story, looking at the wrong side of the screen. Yeah, that's I, funny. Thanks for the tip. But anyhow, I, I noticed that um, now... I, you know, as, as we've worked our way through this hell thing and we notice that people defend the idea of wrath, of God's wrath, they defend that that dark corner of his of his nature, which you never know. You know, let God be God. Let God, you know, he's his ways are mysterious. And, you know, if he wants to wipe us out and destroy us and send a worldwide flood out of his anger, out of his burning anger, then that's his prerogative. Well, I, I don't know. Jesus is his prerogative. That's the way I look at it. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the prerogative of the Father. So if it's not, you know, if it's not found in Jesus, then it's not found in the Father. But, uh, uh, you know, we came out somewhat uh, just cautionary last week. I thought about Bangor itself, trying to just identify it as a work of the flesh, because it says it is. I mean, mm -hmm. anger is a work of the flesh in Galatians. And if you look at all the, the fruits of the Spirit, anger is nowhere there. But wait, it, but how, what about the texts that deal with God is angry? I know, I know we've talked about the written text that we have today versus um, what was mistranslated, but it, God gets angry at something, doesn't he? I don't know. Like this is, this is an interesting topic because we're getting stressed. Like when you, when you made a connection last week, that anger, how we get angry is a reflection of the God we believe in that kind of went, Oh my goodness. I didn't, that, that was like, didn't see that intersection coming. Well, you know, it's real interesting in the Old Testament. If, if you if you look at David's numbering of Israel, there's two versions of that. I think there's one in Samuel and one in Chronicles. But in one place, it says the anger of the Lord was kindled uh, uh, against Israel because of what David did. And it, it doesn't matter what he did. It just, 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 but just take that concept. The anger of the Lord, which is a syn uh, synonymous with what? The wrath of God. The anger of the Lord oh. was kindled against Israel. And then a whole bunch of, you know, people died, you know, got smitten, you know, 80,000 or whatever it was. But in the other, in the other version of that, it says that Satan provoked Israel to sin. All wow. right. So all so, this perspective matters. It, it is. And that one was written later. The Chronicles account was written later in the timeline. More, you know, as we get closer to Jesus, there is a growing awareness of, of the Satan figure and not getting into what the nature of Satan is. That yeah. has nothing, really nothing to do with what we're saying, but they became whatever it is. They, uh, the old Testament saints became in, in Judaism became more, uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that whatever the Satan is or isn't, it's something opposed to the will of God. It's mm -hmm. not working with the will of God. So, so that if, if, if the, if the wrath or the anger of God early on, is it later identified, if we, especially if we believe in progressive revelation, but later right. identified as, as, the, uh, uh, as Satan, as satanic, then that tells us this simple truth, that the works of Satan that Jesus said he came to destroy are, are, are the unrecognized, what, what the Old Testament saints would have called the wrath of God. But it's not the wrath of God. It is the provocations of Satan. All right. And Jesus came and said, Satan is not of my father. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So whether we think of Satan as a dark dynamic or, or a dark angel, it doesn't really matter. Again, I don't want to get into that. That mm -hmm. doesn't matter. But the devil does represent certain personifies certain things that we attribute in New Testament theology to things that are opposed to God's nature, mm -hmm. not things that work with God's nature. So all this by way of saying that if the wrath of God 
is just the the enemy the you know what the, the enemy of humanity the enemy of god working you know untethered from the divine will trying to wreak havoc and death and destruction then we we can confidently say it's not of god mm-hmm. so what what one person might have said was the wrath of god another person says no that, those are the works of satan and then so jesus gives us the final step in it that the works of satan are not of my father my father doesn't will any of this this is coming from the enemy and and the murderer from the beginning is that like the words of jesus saying you don't know what spirit you're of when he's yes said to it, the disciples yeah yeah and that's that's a, that's a great uh thing to go to there in luke uh or john wherever that is um is that uh oh it's in luke but it's it's the thing about uh, you know Samar- the samaritans wouldn't receive them so should we call fire down just like elijah did they quoted the old testament and but remember the old testament would have said elijah was just displaying the anger of the Lord and calling down mm. fire. All right. But it, so should we call down the Samaritans for rejecting us? Because they didn't want them to come through their town. But then, you That's know. Ego. He, That's a huge ego trip too. I know. And Jesus rebuked him. And it says he rebuked him. And he said, you know not what spirit you're of. I came to save human, humanity. I didn't come to to destroy it. So he was he was course correcting. He was course correcting uh, further differentiating the goodness of God. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, all, I've, I've said before, we, you know, in some of our podcasts that we've had, you know, that in the Old Testament, they had a, they had an amalgamated sort of a glop, uh, is what I call it, a glop view of God, where good and evil are in the divine nature. But God is, you know, God is wise, and he knows he, sometimes he comes out of evil, sometimes he oppresses us and afflicts us and punishes us and hates us and smites us. But other times he loves us and forgives us and does all that. Well, Jesus came in the New Testament and said, no, 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 I'm pulling that glop apart. I'm pulling that apart to show that God is only, that my Abba is only light, love, and forgiveness. So all that by way of saying that people hang on to the wrath of the Old Testament, people that we fundamentalists today, you know, they hang on to the wrath of God, to the hate of God. It, it's no different individually. You, you start saying, hey, when you're being angry, you have to be careful that you're not, you're very close to, car- to acting out of the carnal nature. Mm. All right. People don't want to hear that. They want to justify, not, not all people, but I mean, some people want to justify their anger and then point at the issue. It can be abortion. I mean, it can be, you know, it can be anything and, and, and they can to justify so they can clutch onto their anger. And then they always go to Jesus as turning over of the tables. <laughs> you know, well, Jesus was angry. And somebody this week told me that Jesus was continually angry. And when, when this person said that, that this is proof that he was continually angry, and, and I try to think of myself, all right, at any given time, if Jesus is angry, if he operates out of wrath and anger and malice. We're in trouble. And, that, yeah, not only that, but, I mean, worldwide, I mean, at any one moment, how, when would he not have malice and wrath with what's going on in the world? If not with you, then with me. If not with me, then with, with a million, billion others, you know, that are out there. Um, and... So anyhow, I, I think the real question is how we, uh, it's not that, you know, it's like any temptation. Because we are emotional beings, anger becomes a real temptation. It's a temptation for us to get angry. And, is, and, and is, I, it, is it possible it's not so much the anger itself, it's what we allow it to do to us? Because the fruit yeah. of anger can be sin. But this, the anger itself is, I don't think anger is a sin at all. I think it's a natural response, but we can be angry, but not sin. I think we saw that in scripture someplace, but it's also been misused so much that so much sin has come out of excessive anger and unchecked anger. I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, and, and I posted something this week that talked about smelling salts that I get, that I totally get that a, a, an anger, a brief moment of anger, and I mean relatively brief, you know, something you don't let take up residence in you, but something that just in the moment gets you angry, that, that, that can be like smelling salts and alert us. It can alert us to something that we need to engage. But when we dwell on it, when we camp out on it, then, and when we, and when we react to it and the psychologist, uh, I, you know, I said this last time, they talk about this concept, reactive anger, reactive anger versus responsive anger. And I, I was just looking up here when, when we began talking was about uh, I, I found a great article. I'm going to post this on my Facebook site, but it's called The Secret to Overcoming Reactive Anger and Frustration. Mm. And it goes and it, and it really goes into the idea that uh, 
you know, this is what I heard because every week I have clients who have to go through domestic violence court. I'm a criminal. I remember you saying that. That was cool. Yeah. And, and to hear these guys get up and give testimony, they're telling you what they've learned. They have to tell the judge what they've learned. And of course, you know, some of it, some of them might be performing, but most of them are really glad that they've taken this course. They said, I wish I had known this earlier. I, I wish I had known how to get through this. But reactive anger is when you just, you know, you fly out the handle, you're angry. And let's kind of think road rage is the perfect metaphor. <laughs> on mm -hmm. it, I mean, it is. The guy does this, you do that. He does this, you do that, you know. And I mean, I've seen people killed in that situation, Mike. I mean, I, I represented a, a poor fellow that two people died as a result of road rage. But if we use that as a metaphor, how, how often do we engage in road rage theologically? or road rage socially, or road rage politically. I mean, people are reacting, slapping back and forth. He or religiously. Up. Yes, yes, th 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 theologically, absolutely. And, um, you know, so so that's, um, but reactive is when you don't, you you allow, it, it's basically the eye for the eye thing. You know, you, you struck me, I'm angry, I'm striking back. No thought, no deliberation. And, and it never comes from a place of peace. Right, never, and that's what I posted earlier. Uh, I, I said, I have never, if I were to be honest, when I've been mad, I don't ever feel like I've received the prompting or the pleasure of the Lord mm. any direction. Now I have, I will say that anger pro has caused me to, to, you know, driven when I'm at my best, it drives me to say lot, you know, to wait, pause and reflect and say, whoa, this is an injustice. But then I have to intentionally yield and find my place in the Lord with it so that I can hear his peace. You know, it's the peace of God that crushes Satan. Paul said in Romans 16, it's not the retaliation. It's not the anger. And and so you say, well, yeah, but it's perfectly natural to have anger. It is natural that, to have anger. But what we do with the anger, I mean, there, you know, there's lots of emotions we have. You could say that pettiness is an emotion. You could, you, you know, you could say that malice is an emotion. You could say that, you know, that lust has an emotional compact. I mean, these things are to be regulated by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. You know, anything gone too far, I guess, can, can, can become a carnal, you know, can become a carnal act. But in, in terms of the anger, you know, the, 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 you know, the whole thing with Jesus turning over the tables, if you look at that episode, I mean, people use that to justify God killing people. And, here, and here's the thing. I mean, right before he goes to turn the tables over, the, you know, it's sandwiched. There's a sandwich here. And he goes and he sees the fig tree that's not bearing fruit. So then he curses the fig tree. All right. Then he goes and he 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 does the the temple thing, and and then and then he comes back and sees the fig tree a couple of days later destroyed. And he's you know and then he talks about not bearing fruit. Well, there's a big difference between killing a weed, which now become a functional weed, you know, not bearing fruit, versus killing flesh and blood, you know, versus versus killing children or women or or men or whatever. And if he did it in that point, why wouldn't he do it every day with what's going on in this world? I mean, if you go to the road of wrath, there's no end to it. They're yeah. smiting all over the place. People deserve mm -hmm. to be smited, you know, for this and that, if if it's a God who smites. But if it's not a God who spied, smites, but instead suffers, like I would, I mean, I got seven children. If you show me any of my one children, no matter how outrageously they're acting, I'm going to love them, and I'm not going to want them to be eternally tortured or want to torture any one of them. A yeah. Am I puzzled? Am I perplexed by some of this stuff? Yeah. But I mean, it's just, it's just, I don't know. It, 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 there's something in us that wants to defend and justify our anger. And I, I, I think what, what, what I would, what I would pray is it, it, anger is something that needs to be processed and it needs to be processed responsibly because there is an energy to it, but it's an energy that could be sublimated to the Lord. Once we shuck off, the, the the toxic aspect of it well, you there know was a, there was i walked into a grocery store one time where a hardware store and a manager was being reamed out by a very uh irritated customer and was really creating a stink i happened to be dressed up in a suit and i immediately became angry walked over to stand with the manager and call the guy out and the, to me, the anger was a protection anger for this guy because the manager was much shorter and smaller and I knew him and I saw an injustice. So I stepped in and I, I found a way to back out and then police ended up being called. But I, I was angry because of the unfairness going on. But had I reached out to punch the guy, that would be unhealthy for anybody, right? So 
yet I was angry. I went to stand with, and I know there's got to be a way to make room for some healthy responses to anger. Or maybe that's what you're doing. Reactive versus responsive. <laughs> it's yeah. very, the exact same thing, you know, like it, it all depends what your mind f- mindset is like before the event happens. Like, yeah, I, that's good. But this, this, uh, this article that I, I'm going to post on my Facebook site, if anyone's interested, I'll do it the next day or so. But they, they use this tactic that they call reappraisal. And they say reappraisal is actually a two-step process. Step one, pause and observe. The first part of reappraisal is pausing and observing the emotional reactivity you're experiencing. Mm. This means stepping back and taking a fresh look at what has just happened. Imagine you're on a hilltop looking down on the action as an impartial observer or witness might. From this safe distance, look at what is happening with a sense of curiosity and interest. All right. And, and I like that. And then and then, and then uh, just noticing the thoughts and feelings of curiosity helps you to not identify or attach yourself so strongly to them. Mm. Step two, find a fresh and realistic perspective. Fortunately, there is one important thing that you can do for yourself to overcome disappointment, which is not to take it personally. Then mindfulness lets you reappraise thoughts, letting you find more open, creative and alternate alternative paths forward. For example, you may even ask yourself, what is the evidence of these reactive thoughts? In what ways may this actually turn out to be positive? In this way, you open the space for creating more thoughtful and balanced thoughts. This two-step practice can be soothing and help you gain new insights in matters of moments, in a matter of moments. In case you're wondering what happened to my, well, he he gets onto his own example. But anyway, uh, I really like, um, you know, I really like that idea of the sailor, wait, pause and reflect. I've been applying this to my road rage issues. Wow. Okay. I, I see, you know, some guy, you know, some guy cuts off or slows down or slams his brakes. My first response, I catch it is, is to be angry at the person. But then I'm catching myself now because I, I've, I've resolved and I'm, I'm receiving the Lord resolve that this is, it's just, it's just unworthy and it's just lousy, you know, to enter into it. So it's causing me to take a step back. I feel like I go up on that hill. And look down at it, but there's no mm. reason, you know, and just catch myself, just catch my breath. We need to catch our breath before we react in anger. So the pattern previously would have been far more reactive. Like every time it's, it's far, you have a pattern of it. And maybe what people are mistaking uh, Jesus example for, they say, look, Jesus got angry. Yeah, but that was not his pattern at all. His demeanor and pattern was healing and looking and searching and justice and, and truth. It was not, anger was not the default setting, but people today, and even in your circumstance, and I totally identify with it, that for a long time, when driving is a great example, we can become angry really fast because our expectations are everyone's dumb or drives too slow or they drive like an idiot, all that stuff. Everyone's worse. So the ego thinks, you know, we only have time for our own self in our thinking. And it made me, I'll use this example just for fun. I don't know if this will make sense to you. I have a pretty good laptop here that uh, can do many things at once. I needed a more powerful one because I do video processing and all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. So I have a turbo setting. I've got a performance setting. I've got a, a, a quiet setting, all that stuff. If I have too many things going on on this computer, and I might be even in the silent setting, suddenly it's going to kick into the turbo and it's going to use more energy because I got all these tabs open. I got these programs open. I've got video running and it's, it's, it, I can hear the fan just kicking into high gear. I'm thinking, what is going on? And my whole computer slows down if I have even more open. So the, what is, this is our brains. If our brains have too many tabs open, and we've not resolved issues and we're processing difficult circumstances and stresses in our lives. And we don't practice mindfulness. Like you were just saying, I think the reactions are just simply fruit of what's already on our cluttered desk. That's it. And so I think it's like a screaming ding, 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 ding alarm bell. When the pattern of anger is hitting there, something else is wrong. This is not normal. That's what I've perceived. That's powerful. That, and it does drain our power. It, it uh, diverts us. It, it uh, diminishes us because we're, we're spending energy and we don't know. You know, I've always drawn the distinction between an enemy that's at the gate versus an enemy that's within the gate. Mm. Once the enemy gets within the gate, whatever we want to call that enemy, you know, just evil thinking or evil strongholds of thought, 
or emotional reactions or stuff. But I mean, you know, it once it's in the gate, we don't we're getting hit from behind and we don't know what's going on. We don't know why we're angry. We don't know why we're raging. You know, we're raging because something is, is wrong behind the walls. You know, it's one thing when, when I'm at peace, when I'm in the peace of the Lord, I know the enemy's outside the gate. But when I lose the peace of the Lord, then I don't know. I can't really, to a degree, totally trust my thinking on something because I'm so reactive. I tend to just, I don't turn the other cheek. I stick out, you know, I stick out, you know, I, I, I you know, I counter punch. <laughs> you know, I don't turn the other cheek. You got but, four cheeks. What do you mean? Yeah, but you know, I did. Yeah, <laughs> but I didn't even finish with with the Jesus thing, and yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that on, on the turning over the tables. Because here's the thing: if you look at the Greek of what he did, it doesn't st- say that he whipped anybody. It says that he whipped the cattle. That's the way the Greek is interpreted. But that cattle was about to be killed. They were about to be executed. So if he drives them out of the temple, at least they saving live another- their lives. He's saving their lives. In terms of the tables, all it said was he turned over the tables. But here's the thing that every, not everybody, but most everybody misses. Right after he drives out the money changers, then he says, then he calls the children to come in. And the children come in and start praising the God, you know, from their childlike hearts. And he says that he called that perfect praise, you know, comes out of the mouth of the children. He displaced. Just like the fig tree. That's why these two things are connected. The fig tree is, this. There, there's no fruit here. There's no fruit of love. There's no fruit of, of, of any light. There's no fruit here. So to the extent he cursed it so that another fig tree could grow in its place, it would mm-hmm. bear fruit. But that's not talking about flesh and blood. That's, talk, that's, just, that's just using a metaphor of a, of a weed, of a functional weed. You know, Jesus, killer of weeds. You know, But over here with the children, he, he moves them out because they are, it's a corrupt system. And remember, you know, we've talked about this before, but what Jesus would get angry about was never individual human beings. The, I, I never saw him get angry in any of the gospel accounts at a particular individual. He got, he got angry at group thing. He got yeah. angry at hive mind when, when they would come and, 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 and uh, you know, a bunch of them would come and group up around him and try to say all these things. He called out Pharisees and Sadducees. He included them all. This is the religious hive mind of the day. And that's what he would stand against and what, and what he would denounce. But he never called anyone out and threw anyone under the bus individually that, you know, that I can see. The closest he comes is when he calls Herod a fox. But, I mean, that's not really, you know, he, he, you know I think that just has to be, you know. Be a just, compliment. <laughs> yeah, 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 back, yeah, backdoor compliment. You know, he's just, you got to watch that guy. That's just him saying he's a fox. You got to watch him. But, uh, but anyhow, I mean, it, so that whole episode, was about bringing about bringing true praise into the temple. It wasn't about uh, you know beating up so, beating up Pharisees. So that clearing is like the defrag of your hard drive, if you can call it that, yes. right? Yes. You're you're yes. when tech support comes and says, "Hey, my," and I tell them my computer's running too slow. Did you turn it off and restart <laughs> it? Yeah, no. You know, like it's really <laughs> funny. Like there's the obvious things is to reset it because there are programs running in the background that are using up resources. There are thoughts in our backgrounds that are using up our bandwidth of our thinking, and we don't have time. And I know my wife knows when I'm doing too much. When my schedule gets too busy, I become short and snappy. I'm I still love her. I still love my family. All that stuff, but. I was like, I don't have time for that foolishness. Get to your answer. And I treat it like I haven't got time for anything because I don't in my head. And suddenly my family pays for it. And I've had to do a lot of repenting. I haven't perfected it, but it's definitely getting better because there's too much going on. In fact, I got, my one rant is I think COVID, when it started, uh, people have said, people have become so angry since COVID. Let's say, let's call it over for now. Um, uh, after those three years of intensity, it, it, people have become really angry during that time, whether it's political or COVID or mental, whatever, you can pick your category. But my thing is, I don't think COVID has caused a single thing. I think what COVID has done, it's revealed unresolved issues. I think I said that last time, I wasn't sure. Um, but it's resolved the unresolved issues. And so when you have some crisis come in, now it, it knocks over all the apple cart. And like, now you have to deal with the stuff you ch- you chose not to. And it's a big pile. It's chaotic. It's painful. You can get angry, but it just reveals there's a lot going on. And you need some therapy to get through it. You need some help. You need good mentors, good friends. And suddenly anger can go away. A friend of mine has become less angry 
I've watched it because there's a piece, some things have been pulled out of the thinking, removed, and they're not taking a bend with their energy. It's like, you can see it happen. It's like, I'm, I'm observing all this. I'm, this is a message to me. Yeah, uh, that's great. And that gets back to the peace of God, which passes understanding. And it is that which tramples all the works of Satan under feet. And if Satan is the, 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 what used to be thought of as the wrath of God, and peace overcomes it, and the Sabbath rest from Hebrews 4 overcomes it. We've rested from our own carnal works. See, we, uh, we don't want to necessarily, I mean, I understand that we all struggle with anger and that anger does come on us. But the key is it, it, it's like any other thing that has toxicity in it. Yeah, but how do we, do we drink it? Do we drink it? Do we let it go all the way in? Or do we resist it? Do we see it as something to, okay, let, let, let me, let's take a step back. Let's, let's see what this, what this is based on. And then let the Lord enter the situation. Let the peace of God trample this thing under feet in us because we can't help anybody when we're angry. And I, and, and I know some people say, well, you know, I'm, I'm angry and I'm deconstructing and all the injustices. You'll wear yourself out. There's injustices. Listen, for everyone you can think of, I'm in the law business. I see a million every day. You know, it would drive me crazy if I did nothing but think about the injustices. And why am I hating this one and not hating this one as much? Well, because I'm out of energy. You know, I don't have that. I don't have, and, and because hate is toxic. You know, it doesn't cut. But if I so just, is excessive I, anger. Yeah, yeah. So, so if I just sensitize myself to be an agent of peace, you know, I, I will share with you this week. I've had some rough weeks. You know, a few weeks going back, and I've had some blood pressure issues for the first time in my life, and I've I've had hypertension issues, which is totally alien to me. But I've been on medication, and I felt so much better this week, and I had an amazing. I'm an amazing row of mercy shown in the courtroom. And I was still working hard, working hard, but I wasn't uh, hypertense about it. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't angry about it. I wasn't fearful about it. It just was, I felt like I was riding a wave and I, I had like, you know, if I were a dice roll that I'd be, you know, it would be hot dice, you know, rolling in the courtroom. I went in yesterday to a, to a situation. I thought there was no way I was going to get this guy a bond. And lo and behold, the Lord showed up. And I mean, literally, because the guy got up there, came up to the stand as a character witness for me, and he started preaching the gospel. And he started saying, and then I find out later, you know, I find out later that he goes to a prayer meeting with a judge. <laughs> so the judge really respects his opinion, you know. And I, I, I knew that just before I, I called him up there. I called him to come be a witness. But it was like, you know, I did nothing here. I get no credit for any of this. Yeah. And I told the guy afterwards, I said, boy, if I ever need someone to come up and speak to me at the podium, I want you to come up and speak for me. Because <laughs> you're speaking from the spirit of God. Because the DA got up there and said, well, uh, do you think uh, when he did this, what he's accused of here, he was being a responsible young man? Because this guy was a Christian tutor. He had been tutoring him. And uh, the guy said, uh, you know, and I objected to that. The judge let him ask it. And he said, no, I'm happy to answer that. He said, when I was his age, I hung out with the wrong people. And it's only by the grace of God, I didn't get convicted. I got into trouble with a whole bunch of them and I got out of it, but I was just as guilty as they all were. And, you know, God showed me mercy and I've changed my life around and he deserves the same shot. The, the DA's mm -hmm. next line was uh, no further questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But, 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 mm -hmm. but just, it's, it's like our anger keeps us, like you said, it keeps us from focusing on the peaceful solution. You know, we speak peace and, you know, Jesus was sleeping. Jesus was sleeping. He wasn't angry that he was being rousted about. He was sleeping in the storm and he speaks a word to it and stops it. You know, it just makes, you know, we're, we're peacemakers. That, that's what we're called to be. And anger keeps us, in my opinion, from being peacemakers. And can you come up with some situation where someone's angry and speaks peace? Maybe so. You know, but I, I don't have one. All I can testify is that's not my experience. And I, anger always diminishes me. And I just think if we learn this sailor response that we're talking about, what you talked about, you know, just 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 clearing the decks, you know, rebooting, whatever you want to call it, you know, that uh, we can be agents of peace, understanding that there's a part of us, you know, that may be struggling with anger on it, but it's not our power source. If that anger becomes our power source. We, we're in trouble and we may think we're being righteous when all we're doing is judging it with the same wrath it was judging the situation we hate. So you use the word Sela, like we call it Sela. Um, doesn't matter what you call it, but if somebody doesn't know what that is, if you look through the Psalms, you're going to see a whole bunch of uh, sentences, and then every once in a while you hear Sela, you know, and then Sela. 
Um, yeah. I never knew what that meant until I was a young boy, 11 years old. And the only reason I knew what it meant, there was a, um, a new worship team that came out called Sila and they're still going today, but I yeah, saw they them when they, but I saw them when they started, like right when they started and, uh, uh, that they explained Sila as the first time as a young kid. And I really liked the music. That's why I remembered all of it. Um, but that idea of contemplation and pausing, um, what is the pattern? And I know in, in the deconstruction circles, uh, there were times where I've gotten angry at my past. In fact, my first reaction when I first learned some grace, or let's say new covenant, okay, that's a way back. I was very angry at my upbringing church um, and unhealthy anger, I- immature anger, because I hadn't processed it yet. Now I'm thankful for my past. I don't have an anger towards them. I have an anger towards what it did to me and what it's doing to others. And I see the pain in other people's lives. But when we're doing this unlearning and renovation of faith, um, if our if our demeanor is constantly toxic and angry, um, I think there's you better not be a teacher because you're 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 spilling anger on other people and it's it it does reproduce. Um, but I, I really hope that that doesn't become the fruit of the unlearning. The fruit of unlearning and deconstruction, if I can use that word, which was it's a word, sorry. Um, uh, the fruit of it should be loving others more, loving yourself more, and seeing a bigger and better God than you ever thought of. Amen. And and it's loving neighbor, it's loving God, it's loving self, and it's loving enemies. Ah. Uh. And, and see the hate, the, the venom towards enemies, the wrath towards enemies, towards flesh and blood. I don't have a problem in the world with someone being angry at a nasty idea, mm-hmm. you know. But unfortunately, it's not generally the idea. It, it, it's this person that, that's exemplifying the idea. It's not, been, it's not been severed. You know, that part of it's not been severed. And the whole thing with, with the Sela or the Sela, I just like Sela, but uh, you're probably right. I, I don't know. I'm not. Uh, it's just another lens. Okay, but anyhow. But just the idea that the best translation of that just means wait. That means you stop. Okay. You stop. You wait, pause, and reflect. Exactly what the guy was saying in the psychological uh, uh, article I was telling you about. Go up on the hill and look down at what, get out of yourself, get out of your carnal responses, and get up there and see what you're doing. And then let the peace of God rush in there and then follow the peace of God into the situation. And if you still have some level of anger, but at least you're not operating out of it, you've let the peace of God come in and redirect it constructively. That's all. That's all this is about. Is just is learning to yield the yieldedness to the Holy Spirit, and um, uh, and I just think that um, you know that that there's something in us, and I'm this way. Hey, I will tell you I'm this way because I used to get in some nasty bickerings on Facebook, you know, <laughs> and uh, you know, and, and that wasn't of God. I mean, it was like I wanted to be proven right. And somehow my ego kicked into it. And I got angry at this person and, and would, you know, these people and would, would start defending myself, justifying myself and all this. And, you know, it is a great deliverance, Mike, to know that you don't have to justify yourself. OK, even if you are angry, you don't have to justify. Yeah, I mean, it, this is between you and the Lord. It's all the, spir- the spiritual gift of silence or yeah. the spiritual gift of block. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, it was like, I mean, I, I told you this, I posted all this, you were there, you were part of this thing. But I, 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 uh, you and I did a podcast. And on the podcast, I was with somebody that had blocked me previously. No, that I had blocked previously. That was my first thing that my Facebook thing said, I had blocked him. Uh, but then I unblocked him. And he, but here's why I unblocked him. Because I couldn't remember what it was about. I wasn't mad. So because funny. I couldn't remember it. I couldn't, I couldn't remember a thing what about it. <laughs> Now, he still kept me blocked, but he probably did remember. And if I had remembered what it was about, I probably would have kept him blocked. <laughs> but it just shows me, you know, that when it talks about the Lord's forget, the, the Lord forgets our sins. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. oh, God, it's not like he chooses not to remember. No, no, he doesn't remember. And I noticed that this let me be more forgiving because I did not remember what this guy had said or what our, what our thing was about. So all this anger, this anger just prolongs it and keeps you just saying, you know, this guy, he's, you know, he's a false this or he's a false that. Don't listen to him. Don't listen to that. And it robs our smile. You know, when you yeah. get to the end of the day, you know, the thing that I think, if I may compliment you, you know, the thing that, that, that I think is so attractive about you spiritually is that you're happy, you know, and that, it, yeah, you put on a glad, you put on a joyful countenance. 
and you, e you know, you easily smile, you easily laugh. And that is so disarming. You know, that is so disarming, but it's this level of grimness mm. that people that operate out of anger a lot, they're just grim. And, you know, and, and then what used to be humor becomes sarcasm, Yeah, you know, and, that can be and, toxic too. Yeah. So uh, all that, all that by way of saying, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying I walk at all in anywhere close to where I need to be with this, but I guess uh, I always try to go by this rule of thumb and it's, do I feel the Lord's pleasure in this? I, you know, I've shared a time or two that Eric Liddell, who was the, in the movie chariots of fire, he was the actual character, you know, the Olympic runner. And, you know, he would always, when he would be running around the track, he'd throw his head up and he'd smile and then he'd win the race or do at least do well. And they always ask him, why do you throw your head back? He says, because I feel the pleasure of God, you know? And I think that if we make the pleasure of God, what we're seeking above all else, the rest mm -hmm. of God, all the rest of God, we can call it the peace of God. If that's what we're seeking, then we will be able to sleep in the boat. You know, when everyone else is angry and fearful, we'll be able to sleep in the boat and speak to the storm. So that's really what, you know, what it all is about. There's a beautiful text, one of my favorites, Second Peter chapter 1. Um, there's a progression of growing and learning that's, that's listed there. And it's, it's a great list. If you want a list, this is one of the few lists that are worth reading. But when it gets towards the end and it says, um, uh, here we go, uh, self-control and self-control with patience, like thing will lead to patience. Patience will lead to godliness. Godliness will lead to brotherly affection or love for other Christians. And we think that is the pinnacle. But it's not. You just finished saying enemies, and then it says, "Then you will have, you will grow to have a, an uh, an authentic love for everyone." That to me is a signature that includes enemies. Um, that whatever grace you're learning in and growing in is real. If it's if you haven't arrived there, I don't trust it. Um, if you're honest and transparent, great. Then we at least we know we're all on the journey. I'm on the journey. I haven't arrived at that yet, um, but. I tell you, I get more and more nudges as more and more stuff gets pulled out of my brain, more hate gets pulled out of my brain. Um, it's like in that Harry Potter when they kind of pull a string out of your thinking. Yeah. I don't know what that is, but um, in the same way, remove those things that were never meant to be there. And suddenly peace starts to fill and heal. And we can, we can actually progress on this without following a list. We follow Jesus, who is the list. Amen. And, and, you know, I love, I was, you know, you know, C.S. Lewis and Tolkien, they were all called the inklings. I don't know if you ever heard that. <laughs> yep, word. yep. Yeah. But mm. I love that inkling. That's an underused word. An inkling is what you said. You said nudges. You called it a nudge. But that's mm. exactly what the Holy Spirit, he nudge, you know, it nudges us. You know, we're nudged by the Spirit. We're, you know, we're inkled by, you know, we have <laughs> these inklings. And uh, yes. Uh, and here's the thing. I, I have found out, I have really come to realize that the key part of the, the most radical part of Jesus's teaching is not that you love God and neighbor. It's that you love your enemy. Yeah. All right. But yet people talk about Christianity with other two great commandments, love God and love your neighbor. You know, let's work on loving our neighbor, those that are already close to us, you know, yep. they, you know, but you don't hardly ever hear the Matthew 5, 38 through 48, where you love, bless, pray for, walk with, give to your enemies, expecting nothing in return. Yep. I mean, it's like, okay, yeah, 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 it says that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, let's don't go there. Let's don't actually go. I saw a great, I did share a great meme on a Sunday morning about that, where uh, it's easy to love your neighbor. It's easy to love it. What's, if you really want to look like Jesus, it's how you love your enemies. And I thought, okay, that's, that's cool. <laughs> and what, and what part does hate play in that? Because yeah. if you hate, you can't love. Correct. You, you know, and, and I understand that you, now, and, and again, if we go back to Paul's love chapter, in First Corinthians 13, and all the things that love does, love hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. Love rejoices not with iniquity, but rejoices, you know, in good. So the, the closest thing that comes to a negative emotion is it doesn't rejoice. Yeah. All right. It doesn't say he hates. It doesn't say, he, you know, uh, you know, uh, smites or doesn't say we spew at or doesn't say we denounce. It says we don't rejoice. I'm not going to rejoice with this thing. Yeah. So it, you show me a person that when, when something evil when, when happens and they're just not rejoicing, but they're not, they're not smiting it back at it. They're not lashing back of it. I'll show you, I'll show you a person that's got their anger submitted to the spirit. Yeah. Yep. 
I love it. it time is unfortunately up. I got to go. Um, <laughs> Cause it's for us, it's supper. T- well, we're in the same time zone. What are we talking about? Yeah. Um, yep. So let's wrap this up. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the next topic will be. I hope it's the one we did talk about earlier. Um, Cause that's a good one. That'll be a two parter. I know it. Um, okay. But still, this this was a good conversation. I know you posted some stuff. I look forward to seeing your post on your personal page, so what you just uh, said you'd post. And I want to read that too. So thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone. All righty. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. That was good. We could have gone in so many more directions, and it may lead to more questions, which is fine. Um but uh, I hope you were encouraged by it. If, uh, if you enjoyed that conversation, go back and watch part one last week. Uh, everything's always online. Everything is rewatchable. Just because I'm live uh, doesn't mean uh, it's gone. It, it, just, it just gets saved and everything's on YouTube. If you look below in the description, all the links are below how to reach Richard, Bill, uh, all the links for Growing Grace, the church I'm with, Hope Fellowship, everything's there. Uh, just go look. And if you've been blessed by this and this is encouraging, maybe consider supporting it. Uh, we could sure use a, a couple more monthly donors or one-time donations just to help us through. It's uh, I, I hardly ever talk about it. So, hey, I thought I'd ask because it's, it's an important thing to be reminded of. Uh, the gospel is free, but it costs money to get the word out. <laughs> it's pretty cool. All right. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. I look forward to seeing you next Wednesday morning on Still Growing in Grace. After all, none of us have arrived. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.